most heartfelt greetings and salutations, ladies and gentle dams. I eagerly welcome you to Sturgeon's most premier station, Dusk Light Radio, hosted by yours truly, the effervescent Everett J. Blackwell. Perhaps you know of us. We operated the rent a spirit service in town for a century. We even had that centennial discount. Buy one specter, get a haunting free. A lot of folks got in on their revenge hauntings. We even had a mascot, uh, Petey the Poltergeist, advising you to ensure your will clearly stipulates you want to haunt your enemies after death instead of sleeping eternally. He didn't catch on with the skeleton folk. If you're just joining us or this is your first video here, welcome. I'm Dusklight's main and most wonderful undead host. My job at this fine radio establishment is to bring you some of the most twisted, interesting, and downright bizarre tales that I and my wonderful many-legged runners collect from the far corners of Sturgeon and beyond. Some of them will make you laugh, some will make you cry, and some will help fight off the urges to try the succulent juices of forbidden flesh. A disclaimer, this does not guarantee your cravings will be gone and Dusklight FM is not responsible for any feedings consensual or otherwise. We got a lot of trouble for the last time. With that, it's time to introduce our story for this evening. It comes to us from experimental raconteur and perennial pet owner Max Voynich, a man well known for his strange tales and unusual premises. His next story here, The 18 Lives of Omen the Cat, is a tale about Omen and his, uh, 18 lives. Yep. Sometimes the work speaks for itself, people. If you like his work, and well, why wouldn't you? You can find more at his central hub of stories linked below, and as luck would have it, he has a show that looks back at a forgotten television series with some rather sinister undertones. Happy and We Know It is available wherever you consume your audio delights. Special thanks must be first given to Mandy Mo for rendering yours truly in the beauteous image you see when you look at our page. Next, Dusklight bows at the altar of Trevor Henderson, the man behind Siren Head, for allowing Dusklight to use some of the images he's captured of various abominations. Our cast today features narrator TJ Lee, Dusklight's very own janitor shirking off his work again, and the wonderful Romnex, one of the main patrons keeping this place on the air. And last, but by no means least, some of the music you hear today is provided by the Dark Somnium. With gracious thanks. With that, the sun has set and dusk has crawled into the studio once more. Whether you're working, prepping to sleep, or evading the formless void that will one day consume us all, Blackwell is here to soothe your ears and captivate your soul. Now, close your eyes and take in a deep breath. The scene has been set and the light is on. It's time to walk towards it. One. It was a shock when our family cat Nancy passed away whilst giving birth to a litter of only one kitten. And even a further shock when we noticed that this particular kitten, wrinkled and pink, had two heads. Pa said it was an omen. An omen of what? The kitten made a noise, halfway between a squeak and a cough. Pa paused. I don't know. We were silent for a bit whilst we thought on this. We didn't know either, but no one could doubt that it had to mean something. It made for a good name, though. Omen and so it stuck. The vet told us Omen didn't have long for this world, and said that animals with mutations like this rarely lasted more than a few weeks at best. He suggested we make a quick bit of cash and find a museum or a lab nearby to sell them to. Two heads, two sets of genitals, he said. Omen was a five-figure paycheck waiting to happen. We refused. Omen was ours. In the end, Omen would end up outliving that vet, and part of me, although I know it can't be true, believes that Omen always held a grudge against him for what he told us that morning. The vet made a joke in poor taste as we left. Might last a little longer, 
You never know. Nine lives and all. I remember our whole family watching the way Pa looked to Omen's two heads. And then back to the vet. Eighteen. He corrected. Eighteen lives. Two. We spent the next few months hand-feeding Omen. Both of their heads desperately hungry. Ma would often joke that it was like they had two stomachs, with the amount of milk they get through. We'd take turns to feed them in the night, and even though I was much too young to be staying up that late, they could see how much this cat meant to me, and they'd give me an hour or two after dark. Omen had the most beautiful black coat, with sleek white socks and a small cream spot like a monk on the top of their left head. The heads would sometimes chatter to each other and meek little mews when they were alone, as if comparing notes on their new body. Omen always ate better if they could sit on your lap, nestling their body in the fold of your legs whilst both your hands would hold two small bottles for them to suckle from. Uh, sometimes I'd sneak out of bed and sleep on the floor in Omen's room, only to be found and scolded by my parents when the morning came. <laughs> but they didn't mind, really. Omen was our favorite. 3. On the morning before his first birthday, Omen brought in a two-headed mouse, clamped in the right head's jaws. The thing was limp, and it made a soft pat when they dropped it on the floor. I must have been 12 at the time, but I remember poking the mouse with a brush, turning it over to have a better look at each head. I was so absorbed in the rodent's strange biology, I completely ignored the sound of my mom and pa coming to stand behind me, hands on hips, watching me watch it. I think it's a message. Pa said. Ma made a noise. I think they're telling us they're not alone. Both the moments' heads mewed in sync, as if to agree. Four. We went on holiday as a family, and as much as it pained us, we were unable to bring Omen. Omen knew something was up when they saw us putting our clothes in the bags, and when we all left at once, and they tried to sink their claws into our shoes to beg us not to go. But we had to, and we did. When we returned, some burned and at ease, we found that Omen had taken the time to smash every single clock in the house. 5. Omen would bring in all sorts of creatures. Rodents, small birds, beetles it found interesting, frogs, toads, and even fish every now and again. One evening in particular, the family were gathered around the TV, watching, I can't remember what, when Omen strolled in, sat straight in front of the screen, attention please, and dropped the bottom half of a squirrel at its feet. The organs and intestines were hanging out, putrid and red, and we could see the way Omen's fur was matted around the mouth. He thinks we're hungry, trying to feed us, Pa said. Disgusting! Don't look half bad. If you're so hungry, you can clean it up. Omen watched with disappointment as Pa dropped the offering into the bin. Though I didn't miss the whisper that followed. Sorry, Omen. 6. We lived in a big house, and family and friends would often cycle through, staying in various rooms when they encountered problems of their own or just needed a roof over their head for a while. Our uncle came to stay with us during the last days of his life. There was no more modern medicine could do for him, and he told everyone he wanted to die with dignity. We obliged him. And so, for the last week of his life, Uncle lived as normal a life as he could, told stories until he grew too tired, never complained, and despite our protests, slipped home in meat and fish under the dinner table. Around 24 hours before he died, Omen took up a vigil by his bedside. We'd been advised by the nurses that we should keep Omen away, and having a cat that close would only cause trouble, and she'd never know where your pet had been. But that day... Omen wouldn't budge. They hissed and bared their teeth whenever anybody made a motion to pick him up, and the whole thing quickly became more hassle than it was worth. It was clear Uncle was deteriorating, and we didn't want to disturb what could be his final moments. Omen lay on his stomach without moving for water or food all day. Both of their heads stood watch, making periodical sweeps of the room, examining the doorway. About an hour before he passed, Omen watched something. Invisible to the rest of us, enter through the door and come to stand by Uncle's bed. Omen mooed softly, pleadingly. The sound grew and grew until eventually, Omen was silent. Five minutes later, 
whilst holding Mama's hand. Uncle nodded as if greeting an old friend and took his last breath. Seven. Ma told us she was pregnant. In response, Omen sneezed twice, one for each head. Eight. Ma had twins, and God, Omen loved the twins. From the moment they came home, Omen was all over them, transfixed by their angelic little faces, their impossibly thin wisps of air, their laughs and their cries. I could almost hear Omen's thought process as the both heads stared up at the newcomers. Two of them, just like us. Two of them. Nine. A local kid who must have been roughly the same age as the twins at that point, say around four, fell from the top of their garden wall and broke their skull in the concrete below. Our neighbors told us that they found Omen at the scene, lapping at the pool of blood as if it was a cream in a saucer. The broken child was taken to intensive care immediately, but despite the doctor's best efforts, the child didn't make it. Omen came home with blood matted in the fur around their mouths and turned their noses up at the dinner we prepared. They were full. 10. An old woman with matted hair and yellow teeth came to the door. She said that she'd seen our cat and she would pay good money to take him off our hands. She looked like a ghost dragged through a swamp. Her skin was so pale you could see the mass of veins underneath contracting like small worms. And when she spoke, it made my skin hurt. Cats like that are bad luck, she said. Touched by the devil, she said. But we told her that they were ours and that they were family. She snarled and spat on our front door. I'll see you soon, she said. Eleven. One night I heard a noise from the kitchen. Upon investigating, I found that someone was banging against the door. I recognized the voice. The woman from the week before. She was hammering the door now with her fist. Frantically. Let me in. Let me in. Let me in. She said over and over and over and over again. I stood, paralyzed by fear. There was something about her I didn't trust that I couldn't trust. I'd seen the way she looked at Omen. Like she wanted them for something. Then the noise spread over out the house. And I was aware of the windows on three separate sides of the room. And that through each window, as I turned, I could make out the same dark figure pounding against the glass, screeching. It was as if there were several of her. All silhouettes, all at once, begging and pleading to be let in. And the voice cracked and changed, grew hoarser and harsher, and before long she didn't sound much like a woman at all, but something hungry and vicious. Pa eventually came down and found me hiding under the table. Almond was sat, facing the door, tail flicking from side to side. Pa said it in the following silence. He could hear the heads chattering away to one another. He said they sounded serious, concerned. Twelve. I was brushing my teeth the following week, just after my shower, when I heard something scratch at the door. I tried to ignore it. Sometimes Omen would do this, beg to be let in after you'd had a shower so they could drink the water around the drain. The mod said we had to stop Omen from their more unsavory habits in case we had guests. I kept the door firmly shut. Omen grew more and more persistent, raking their claws down the wood and mewing as if there was a fire. I could have sworn the door was shut, but in my reflection, behind me, I could make out the door start to open, slowly, fraction by fraction. And my hand stopped moving the brush, leaving it stuck in my mouth like a cocktail stick when I saw a hand slowly emerge from the door in the reflection. A hand and a face that I recognized. A gnarled and ancient face, all gums and loose skin, and I could see the woman slowly force her way into the room in the mirror and falling backwards. It was all I could do to try and grab the door, slipping on the handle. 
The door flew open in both real life and the reflection. And as I staggered back, I could see the woman now dead on, smiling, reaching out towards the surface, towards me. And my hand found something hard and heavy, and it was all I could do to throw it at the mirror. There was a crash, the sounds of falling glass, and the silence. It took me a while to absorb my surroundings for the adrenaline to wear off. I'd thrown my alarm clock, the heavy brass thing that was so loud it was impossible not to wake up. Omen was sat by the shattered clock, their two faces reflected endlessly in the dozens of mirror shards that covered the floor, blinking and preening themselves before stepping closer and pushing their forehead against mine. Just for a moment, I felt as if I touched something old and dark and so hot, and then Omen pulled away and left me to clean up the mess. 13. The twins were followed home by a strange man in a long coat, with thin blonde hair that he'd very carefully slicked back over his otherwise bald head. He made lewd gestures at them, which they could repeat but not understand, and said words that made Ma blush. Ma said she'd found the man by her gate, staring into Omen's eyes, all four of them without blinking said she told the man she'd call the police and that he should get off our property this instant. But the man stayed still, wouldn't take his eyes off Omen, spoke strange words to himself under his breath, prayed. When the policeman came, sometime later, the man was gone. 14. The strange man made local headlines, filling his pockets of rocks and throwing himself into the river. They said he finally lost it, and the weight of whatever he'd done had finally caught up to him. But I knew something had happened that day. Omen had shown the man something in that moment. Shown the man something so real and terrifying, he'd had no choice but to drown himself. And, as if to confirm my suspicions, Omen coughed up a wet, blonde hairball. 15. Omen discovered catnip had spent three days in the daze, like some sort of feline junkie, until Ma caught them staring at their own reflection. Embarrassed, Omen quit their newfound habit there and then. 16. Omen brought in the top half of the squirrel whilst we were watching TV. The twins laughed. Pa said, Looks familiar. Ma said she felt something a little like deja vu. Try as we might, and couldn't place it. 17. Omen was sick in the night, and when we took him to the vet, she showed us her tattoo of a two-headed cat. It's just like yours. I've never seen a real one. She said, feigning surprise. But the look she shared with Omen made me think otherwise. 18. Omen spent their last five nights with each one of us. First Pa, then Ma, then the twins for one night each. And last of all, me. They slept by my side, purring like kindling whenever I'd tickle one of their chins. We both knew that their time was nearly up, and they were growing old, and what had once been muscle and fat had quickly become skin and bone. Their eyes were not as sharp, and they developed a thin, milky membrane. Sometimes one head would wake the other, and they'd spend a while bickering before they realized they were talking to themselves. Before they passed, they made one last, slow circuit of the house, checking behind each door and under each bed, as if to say to us and to the twins, See, you're safe now. We buried Omen under their favorite tree in a little wooden box we filled with shredded newspaper. Just above the box, to commemorate Omen, we planted a single orchid. We thought that every time we looked out and saw the flower, we'd be reminded of our friend, our protector. And it was a surprise to none of us when, a month later, we saw two green buds rising from the soil. Well, aside from our janitor trying to imitate me, I feel a little emotional. 
If corpses can feel emotion, that is. I think I'm gonna go hug my pangolin, Baron Von Scalington, and let him know that I love him very, very much. Maybe you should do the same, if you have any pets you love. Failing that, maybe a plushie or an exotic pet from the next dimension, whatever you prefer. If you enjoyed this video and you stuck to the end, you have my thanks. Be sure to check out some of our other transmissions. We're adding them regularly and we'd love to have you as part of the Dusklight family by subscribing, hitting the bell of oblivion, it's just a normal bell but adding stuff like that is nice, and leave a comment with stories you'd love for my many legged runners to find for me to read. And one last time listeners, close your eyes and breathe with me. Remember, no matter how bad things are, Dusklight will be here to provide you with some respite. Drink some water or your state mandated potions. You matter and you are loved. I'll see you again when the sun sets and dusk enters the station. <laughs>